before we move on further, I just want to remind you again that if this seems overwhelming, I highly recommend going to the Phosphor G Academy. Uh, they have five free courses, uh, of which um, the Introduction to Remote Sensing is would be a great place for you to get a lot of background with this. Uh, there's free lectures, free videos. Uh, the Introduction to Geospatial Technology will get you started if you're brand new at this. Uh, they have labs and lectures that you can all access online. The most important of these would be uh, the Understanding Remote Sensing and Aerial Photography uh, module, which is here. And it walks you through the basic principles uh, and uh, understanding the quality of images, what types of error that you might have, uh, and so on. So again, I highly recommend uh, these resources as a good place to start if you're feeling uh, a little overwhelmed by it all. As well, I should mention that while the commercial services uh, such as SecureWatch are, can be very important for those who have the budget to use it, there are open data programs uh, through businesses such as Maxar. Again, Maxar is consolidating many data products from many satellites together uh, and gets that 30 centimeter resolution. So here's their open data program. Uh, which is mostly for disaster response, and by disaster, they mean not political, uh, typically, but natural disasters, although they do have uh, all parts of the world. So um, you hear, see here Papua Indonesia, South Sudan. You can go in and you get excellent 30-meter resolution imagery of an entire location that's impacted by a natural disaster. So that's an, um, an opportunity for you to uh, take advantage if... Uh, you are monitoring a situation that involves a natural disaster. For any other type of humanitarian uh, disaster, whether political or di natural disaster, there is something called the HOT OSM tool. The HOT OSM tool is based at export.hotosm.org. Um, this is the OpenStreetMap tool that allows you to take out any vector information. Now, vectors, things like roads, um, houses, buildings, uh, locations for getting people together, it allows you to take all that data out and put it into a GIS. So again, this is, we've moved beyond just having a website that shows stuff to having an ability to export things. Um, now they've got many different, um, they've got many different tutorials on how to use this. You need an account uh, with OpenStreetMap, which will then allow you into the hot export hot OSM export tool. You can export in many different file formats. Again, KML allows you to look at it in Google Earth if you don't have other specialized GIS. Uh, Garmin would allow you to put it into different sorts of GPS units and analyze that in different software. Shapefile and GeoPackage are probably the most common uh, for GIS programs. So Shapefile comes from Esri and the GeoPackage is a newer open uh, licensed version of a vector file that allows you to bring all sorts of data in, like as I've mentioned, buildings, commercial areas, communications, education, emergency, finance, healthcare, humanitarian, so on. So this is a, an, an opportunity not necessarily to monitor a situation, uh, but to get information about what's there. Uh, as well, um, there is an entire group of people through Hot OSM that creates information based off of emergencies. So um, basically, if there is an emergency somewhere, say in Nepal, when they had uh, earthquakes and, and a lot of buildings falling down, people will come together to use remote sensed data, uh, whether that comes from Bing or other locations, to actually digitize things like roads. So this is a great place to get that type of information. I'm focusing a bit more on the imagery analysis in this workshop, uh, but I just wanted to mention this in case the, you're, you're actually looking at it. Uh, so I, I did run um, a, an actual export uh, from uh, Basanchar, uh, and, and I exported it as Google Earth uh, as a shapefile and as a geo package. Uh, and you know, if you, rec if you export one uh, region, so here I've, I've selected a, uh, an area of interest and it just identifies Basanchar as a floating island. Uh, but if you export one region, having in multiple data formats can be good as several websites and software platforms use the data differently. So it's nice to have the data uh, that can go multiple ways. 
Now, those are vector sources, but in order to get access to the largest uh, database of uh, different sorts of imagery types, you can always use USGS uh, Earth Explorer. So USGS Earth Explorer is just earthexplorer.usgs.gov. You need to set up an account. Um, once you've set up an account, you can search anywhere in the world to get imagery. Uh, there's always the option of uh, going somewhere in the world and then zooming in uh, so that you can get to where you want to be. Uh, this satellite image, we're lucky in that it shows uh, our area of interest. If you have a KML or shapefile, then you can just upload that and keep that consistent across platforms. One way of creating a KML or, K or, or shapefile uh, is through a website called geojson.io. So I'll just show you that quickly before we get into USGS Earth Explorer. So here we have uh, basically a, a website that allows us to produce automatically a GeoJSON. And you see again here we have some issues with our um, area of interest not being shown. So here it is on Earth Explorer, and here it is in geojson.org. This is largely to do with uh, the the background map, the vectorized map that does not include uh, our area of interest. So again, it might be as easy for you, it might be much easier for you to just use, say, zoom into a place. Here you see two different, actually three possibly different satellite images being overlapped, which is why the island looks different. Uh, it might be able to zoom in a place and use the map, it selects the coordinates for that map, uh, or it might be uh, easy for you to easier for you to actually use uh, a manual adjustment. So here I'm placing uh, dots using my left clicker on my mouse uh, to say this is my area of interest. And you see how that populated the Latin long. Um, or it might be easier for you to um, actually upload a KML or shapefile. Uh, this also can be useful, the geocoder, but a lot of the places that we deal with in humanitarian and other uh, types of complex political emergencies, uh, we actually don't um, have good geocoding in those areas. So if you needed to do a KML or KMZ, say you had one from elsewhere, you could try to make one here. Again, not great because we don't have a perfect overlap of our uh, we don't actually have any representation of our island, so let's just uh, click here. So I'll go ahead and make a straw polygon, click and drag a rectangle, and we'll hope that that covers the whole area. So that would be uh, save as KML, or save as shapefile, or save as GeoJSON, depending on other programs, but KML and shapefile are the most common. Uh, in, in a lot of circumstances. And then you would upload that here and that would show this area. Again, I mostly rely on the actual satellite imagery to mainly outline an area, uh, but for consistency's sake, you might wanna be doing the import of Shefile or KML. So once I've done that, then I go into the data sets. Now, uh, Landsat 8 is great, it gives 30 meter resolution. Um, it has all the bands that we need to find out a bunch of information. However, Sentinel is um, better in terms of resolution. So we'll look, you just type into the data set search Sentinel, you'll get Sentinel 2. Let's go ahead and select that, press OK. This is pulling basically the same information that you would get through the European Space uh, Agency in terms, of in terms of Sentinel 2. It does not pull all of the other uh, Sentinel products, but again, we're not that interested in those other ones for our purposes. Uh, it's looking, it will look for any place that's within the area of the interest that ha Sentinel has overlap. So if your area of interest contains too much space, you should probably adjust it so that you're making sure you're not capturing other tiles. The problem with capturing other tiles is that you will suddenly have multiple large images to download rather than one. So it's good to get your space down to exactly where it needs to be. There is also the issue that this island, for example, has changed over time, so you may want to give a buffer. But these are all things that you need to think about in terms of your own research and what you know about the site itself. So we've got Sentinel-2 selected. Uh, we'll look at the additional criteria. 
let's say we want less than 20% cloud cover. You can make uh, many other adjustments here. We'll look for all Sentinel products and we'll just go to the results. Oh, I should have set a date. Let's just set a date really quick. Uh, let's put it December 1st until today. So there we have our dates. Let's look at our results. So we have uh, an image. Uh, this is uh, captured our location, has less than the amount of cloud coverage that we specified. Uh, you may get more images if you adjust your cloud coverage. So let's say that all, look at our results. Now we have three images. Again, you need to be keenly aware of whether your location is actually 100% covered. You see this image here, I'll pump it into the map, it is basically um, by this show browse overlay. So we've got the footprint. Here's the show browse overlay. Let's see what we get there. It's actually clouded. It's not showing up, but it's, it's too cloudy, as you can see from here. Um, so you see the cloud coverage uh, within the metadata if you actually click on the image. Uh, that shows the datum, the map projects, and cloud cover is 88%. So that's pretty useless for us. Um, this one, so hopefully it'll visualize, not visualizing, but uh, this one, it actually uh, doesn't cover quite the area that we need it to. Um, it says it does, but it's actually only covering here. So you can look at how this image over here uh, cuts off our main lo location. And this one pretty much does everything we need it to. So we download this one. Uh, you have to sign in to download it. There's two options, it's a full browse, full resolution browse and GeoTIFF format. This is an image which is much smaller than the tile. This image you would download uh, just so you can preview things. The tile, which is here in this case, 448 megabytes will provide us um, with uh, much more detailed information. In fact, it includes uh, several several bands, uh, which we then need to actually analyze our image. Now you may remember that the previous sites we looked at actually had later information. So this is, while USGS usually keeps all the Landsat information, it keeps much of the Sentinel-2 information uh, eventually it's quicker to get the most latest information from sites that are dedicated to sentinel so some of those sites again are the sentinel hub so you see here again we downloaded that image from uh, december the 18th uh, and if we want to take this down we click over here and we can choose our coordinate system we should probably choose uh, the wgs 1984 you want high resolution and of all these here you would take the TIFF. The TIFF is the one that provides the most information for us. Uh, we definitely want it to be geo-referenced. Uh, these are geo-TIFFs, so they're geo-referenced. Uh, you can choose a specific visualization or not, or we can choose raw bands. And if we choose raw bands, uh, then we get uh, this raw information that we can then put together within QJS and other programs. So these are the raw bands. These are specific visualizations. Um, you could do both if you wanted. You could have a visualization and then have the raw bands to do your own analysis. Band two, three, and four are also what is known as red, green, and blue. So four, three, two, red, green, blue. They are combined to make a true color image. Um, and band eight is the near infrared, uh, which we use for things like NDVI. Again, if you're brand new to this, this is a lot of information to take in. Uh, but I'm giving you the big overview so that you can um, you can actually understand what you're getting into. You, if you were actually trying to uh, do some analysis on particular uh, things like burnt houses again, you would want to get uh, specific bands in order to do that analysis. Uh, and often the near infrared uh, will provide in the shortwave infrared will provide more than just the visual bands that are presented here, uh, 432 in uh, true color. Another option is to look at the Copernicus Open Access Hub. This is sci-hub.copernicus.eu. The Copernicus Op Open Access Hub uh, provides if, uh, access to the most up-to-date Sentinel data. 
So um, in this case, again, we're focused. I, you know, I tried to search for Basanshara. It didn't actually find it. You can see again that the map itself it's here is not showing it. If I go into to the cloudiness, I can see that my island is there, but it was not showing on the map. And now I'm selecting the actual area of interest. Uh, if I, so go click over here. If I uh, am ready to do my search, I have to click on Mission Sentinel 2. Uh, there are various options here. Uh, given the short amount of dates that we have, I'm, I'm happy just to leave these options unselected, but they're about the type of platform and about the type of product. Uh, we'll be able to see that within our search results. So once we've done all of that, we've got our area of interest. We've got Mission Sentinel, Sentinel 2 selected. We'll do our search. Um, oops, I need to get rid of that. Let's do our search again. So you saw last time it selected Basanshar and the actual footprint. And then when I got rid of Basanshar, it just went for the footprint. So here we have S2A, uh, which is the Sentinel, Sentinel 2 data. Um, these download URLs will cause us to download a large amount of data. So you have 700 megabytes here, 572, 710. Um, it's good to know about the data products we're downloading. Uh, the dates are embedded within the actual description. So here you have 2019, 1223, uh, 2019, 1228, so just a few days ago. The cloud cover you can see over here makes those images not worth it. Uh, in terms of the, our ability to do a lot of the analysis that we want. Um, we can go down here. Uh, let's look at again our, we have our 1218. That's looking pretty good. Uh, our 1223, uh, we might be able to get some information on that. And here's another from 1223. So let's go ahead and check those two 1223s out to see which one might provide us the information we need. Mission Sentinel-2, instrument and MSI, the sensing date, uh, and the size. So let's go ahead. This will give us a zoom to the product. This will actually just see a little product detail, which will tell us more about the cloud cover and other possible data issues that we might run into. So here is our cloud cover. Again, not great for us. Uh, we've pretty much lost our ability to do much detection here unless we uh, know how to black out some of the cloud cover and use the other sensors. But our two, three, four bands will be severely occluded. Uh, and those are our 10 meter bands. We're almost unable to use this. Uh, you can go through this link here. This is all of the data that would be in that uh, 700 megabytes. Uh, you can actually see within the granule. So these tiles are called granules. Uh, if you click through, you can see that there's um, specific bands. And here they've grouped these bands by 10, 20, and 60. So as I mentioned, the 10 meter bands are mostly the uh, band two, three, four, and eight. And those are the ones used for a lot of this type of high resolution analysis. Uh, I guess it's now medium resolution, but this is what we used to call high resolution 10 years ago. So if you downloaded those bands in the last um, image there, uh, you can open up QGIS and load these bands. Uh, there's a simple drag and drop. Uh, if you're looking for where the bands are, you'll have to know how to unzip the files. Once you've unzipped the files, uh, then you will have folders. Uh, typically, if you get information from Sentinel-2, it labels it as safe. Uh, so even this one here that I had, when I unzipped it, it had a subdirectory called safe. Uh, and But if you download them directly from the website, like I did for that 1218 uh, image, then I just get the bands that I download directly, the 2, 3, 4, and 8. I've dropped all these bands in here, as well as their accompanying information. Uh, they have kindly given us a true color image, TCI, at 10 meters, uh, as well as you can see band two, three, three, and four. 
and oh sorry, that's two. So that's eight, and that's three, and that's four. You can see how different sorts of features really stand out in these different bands. And again, this is all 10 meter resolution. So what's the point of getting actual bands within something like QGS? Well, you build a virtual roster uh, so that you can actually detect things that you want to detect. So this particular um, virtual roster is bringing together, so we've got the symbology here, a multi-band is putting red, green, and blue so that we have this visual image. If I change any of these, I'll get slightly different images that bring out different components. What I like to do in QGIS is to use the layer styling to really explore these type of uh, images, right? So we can go in and actually change the, the saturation, uh, the contrast, uh, and the brightness to really bring out some features. Uh, you know, I might be interested in what these dots here are actually representing uh, and do some investigative research. So you can, just by simple color changes, you can use your naked eye to uh, bring out some of the features. You can also, uh, using these different layers, uh, especially if you've downloaded all of the layers, uh, then you can use these different layers to start building things like uh, NDVI. So, <laughs> so let's look quickly at what an NDVI might look like. So this is an NDVI and I've given it a specific um, color scheme uh, that really makes the the um, healthy vegetation stand out uh, in September uh, of uh, sorry this is November of uh, November 18th of this year so this is a older image uh, but you can see how actually studying this vegetation uh, might give you some clues gives you better clues about where the water's at uh, might give you some clues about new buildings that have come out uh, there are many, uh, not too complex, but more advanced processes that you can use to comp to combine, or things that you can see uh, by combining these bands. And if you use the roster calculator, you can do things like create this in DVI. So it's a little bit beyond the scope of probably what you're looking at, uh, but I want you to know the possibility is here. And again, if you just wanted to look at NDVI over several dates, you could use those previous websites that I showed you in uh, previous slides or earlier in this workshop and just to show you the difference between the sentinel data and the landsat data here is a really beautiful landsat image uh, it's, a, it's a virtual band which i created virtual brands are can be created by uh, using this function in qjs it's under roster miscellaneous build virtual roster uh, but this is is a quite good image in terms of cloud cover very little of it but again, you can see that our ability to see detail is much more limited by the Landsat. Um, you might be able to use something like this to compare to the Sentinel data that you get another month later or a few days later. So it's good to be able to sort of think about how to compare the different data sets, um, especially if you're using the naked eye, it's not that critical uh, that they be exact same resolution. Uh, but you're trying to build an evidence database uh, for changes that might happen. Now, if you're interested in moving forward with learning more about actual data analysis um, and the, the sense of doing supervised or unsupervised classification, there's two main resources that I would recommend to you. While you can, again, pay for the commercial platforms that provide you high precision 30 centimeter uh, images, as well as automatic conversions to specific remote sensing indices, or um, use those websites I showed you earlier, the eos.com uh, or the you know Sentinel Hub or other ones to actually render things online. If you're going to use QGIS, you really need to learn how to use what's called the SCP plugin. So this entire uh, workshop here uh, you can download. It has the answers uh, as well as the instructions. Uh, you can download this all using the link here. So just you go to http dot dot uh, slash slash bitly slash remote scp. Now this will show you how to do 
to develop signatures, spectral signatures within um, within QJS using the SCP plugin. This uh, is beyond the scope of this workshop in the sense that this is probably about a three to six hour uh, workshop, this, this one here, uh, if you go and download it, uh, that you'll be able to do. If you have problems with uh, completing this or downloading anything, uh, I would highly recommend, and even if you don't have problems completing this or downloading anything, I would highly recommend going to from gis to rs.blogspot.com. This is an incredible resource for doing uh, semi-automatic classification and, class and uh, manual classification through QGIS. Um, it's a wonderful plugin uh, and it has um, many, many tutorials that you can walk through in order to get your, uh, yourself up to speed. As well, uh, the user manual is really a gold mine of, of knowledge. Uh, so if we just take a quick look at that user manual, it comes as either in many languages, uh, as either PDF or uh, in uh, links down here below. And just to be clear, I really believe that you should ground yourselves in the basics of the science before you move forward. So if you're going to do this, I highly recommend reading at least this chapter before even starting uh, the tutorial that I showed you in Google Drive or any of the tutorials here on this website for the SCP plugin or semi-automatic classification plugin. Um, that third chapter there walks you through basics of GIS as well as several multi spectral satellites uh, where you can see, as I referred to these bands and their resolution, uh, as well as what wavelengths they are using. So if you do need to use multiple satellite types uh, or data from multiple satellites, uh, and you will know that these bands don't always correlate exactly to the same. For example, band eight here in Landsat A is panchromatic and band eight in the um, Sentinel-2 is near infrared. And then you have your short wave infrared here. Uh, things like the Cirrus band, which helps you actually pull out clouds if you get more advanced. So these are important, um, important tools uh, and data sources for you to realize uh, this is not just something you should try to do over a night or over a weekend. This is a pretty serious endeavor to get into and to do correctly. Uh, I'm happy to respond to questions if you uh, have them. Um, I'm also happy to put you in contact with certain resources uh, in terms of people, human resources, as well as to point you to online free resources. Uh, I hope that you learned a lot from this workshop. Um, I hope that you uh, are able to, were able to follow and that you go and do use the uh, links that I put into the notes on this lecture slash workshop uh, to take yourself further and um, to use this amazing tool uh, to, to support human rights. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Arthur Gilgreen, uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Bye-bye, and Happy New Year 2020.